Hello and welcome to this video on solving systems of equations using matrices. So if you've been following our series of videos on matrices, we first of all introduced um, some basic operations and we've also talked about how we can find things like the determinant and the inverse of matrices. And we're going to be using some of those techniques in this section as well. So it's worth going back and watching those videos first if you haven't done already. So let's suppose, first of all, that we're presented with a system of equations like the ones shown here. In fairness, if you're familiar with solving simultaneous equations using elimination or substitution methods, you might be happy to find the solutions to x and y and z without using matrices. But what we'll see is that matrices has the advantage of being able to be used on much larger systems of equations, as well as systems that might have decimals or fraction coefficients, which might prove to start becoming very difficult and time consuming when we're solving using ordinary methods of simultaneous equation solving. We're going to use two methods in this video. We're going to use the method of Gaussian elimination and we're going to use the method of the inverse matrix. Before we use either of these, we're going to present the system of equations above in matrix form. We're going to group the coefficients of x and y and z to form a square matrix. And we're left with two 3 by 1 matrices or column matrices, which we see here. Um, one of them contains our unknown values x, y and z. And one of them contains the results of our, of our equations 37, 66 and 60. So the first method that we said that we were going to use is one called Gaussian elimination. And Gaussian elimination is a method that involves adjusting each of the rows in our system until we have a result where the square matrix is close to an identity matrix or as close as possible. So here's a visualization of the result that we want to achieve. And what you can see is that our diagonal terms from top left to bottom right are all one. And the lower left hand terms are all zero. In the top right hand corner, these terms here, I've denoted with this hash uh, symbol, but really we would ideally like these to be zero as well. But if they're not, it's not a big deal. So the objective is to take the square matrix that we saw in our formulation and transform that matrix so that it looks something as close to our ideal uh, matrix that we've seen here as possible. And to do that, we're allowed to do two things. We can perform row operations so we can multiply a whole row or divide a whole row by any number. The second thing we're allowed to do is row combinations. So we could add one row to another row or subtract the values from one row from another row. And if we're going to perform these operations um, correctly, what we really should do is include the answer column that we saw in our original formulation as well. And so what we'll do is we'll start by writing um, this matrix here. It's, it's not really a matrix. This is just a sort of shorthand. Um, but you can see that we've got our square matrix and just separated my colons here. We've got the answer column here as well because we have to include this answer in our transformations. We'll see this in, in an example as we, as we go through. So what we're going to do is try and morph this matrix here so that it looks as close to our Gaussian ideal as possible. And there's no one right way to do this. Um, there's, there's probably uh, many, many different methods and you might even see a method that's much more convenient than the one I'm going to go through here. But let's have a stab at this and see what we can get. So what I'm going to start by doing is I'm going to start by doubling the second row. So the second row was 4, 6, 7 and 66 and doubling all of those terms we have 8, 
12, 14, and 132. Now, the reason I've done this is because if you look here, um, we now have the first terms in our second and third row are both 8. And remember, we want all of those terms uh, in the bottom left-hand corner to be 0, ideally. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract the values from the third row from the values of the second row. And so what I'm going to be left with is 8 minus 8 is 0. 12 minus 4 leaves me with 8. Uh, 14 minus 2 leaves me with 12. And 132 minus 60 leaves me with 72. Now, even though I've involved row 3 here, I'm not changing row 3. Row 3 stays the same. So now uh, we've got a 0 here, which is good. Let's see what more we can do. Um, let's take the first row and multiply the first row by 4. So now we have, rather than 2, 5, 3, and 37, we have 8, 20, 12, and 148. Again, well, why am I doing this? Well, hopefully you can see that the first terms now are uh, both 8 in the first and third rows. And so let's suppose we take um, the, the first row away from our third row here. And so 8 subtracting 8 um, in the third row, we're going to be left with 0. Um, 4 minus 20, we're going to be left with minus 16. We're allowed minus values, that's not a problem. Um, 2 minus 12, we're left with minus 10. And our result here is going to be 60 minus 148, which is minus 88. So again, my, my objective and, and my kind of way of thinking when I'm looking at this, I'm again looking at these bottom left terms. How can I make these bottom left terms zero? And like I say, there's no one right way to do it. Um, here, though, I'm left with this um, minus 16. Again, this is one of the other terms that in the ideal should be zero as well. These three bottom left terms should be zero. And so what I'm going to do is um, multiply this middle row uh, by 2. And when we do that, we have now the middle row 0, 16, 24, and 144. Hopefully you can spot why I've done this, because again, I'm looking to um, get rid of this minus 16. And I've created a, a positive 16 here in the second row. And so now I could take um, row 3 and add the values from row 2. And so the, the third row becomes now 0, um, because 0 plus 0 is still 0. Uh, 0 again, 16 plus minus 16 is going to give me 0. Uh, 14, and that being equal to 56 in the result. So now we have this um, situation where the bottom left terms in our um, sort of transformed matrix are all zero. And that's very close to the ideal that we're trying to achieve. But remember that really what we wanted was all of these diagonal terms, 8, 16, and 14. Really, we need all of these diagonal terms to be equal to 1. Now, remember, one of the other um, rules that we can apply is we can multiply or divide uh, a whole row by any number. And so, really, what we're going to do here is very simple. Uh, we're going to divide this whole row, this whole first row, by 8. We're going to divide this whole second row by 16. And we're going to divide this whole third row by 14. And so, what we get is something that looks like this. Everything now um, has uh, been divided by uh, numbers that mean that the diagonal terms are all 1. And just to keep things as accurate as possible, I've made the other terms 
into rational numbers rather than getting into decimals, which is a bad idea if we can help it. As it happens, these, um, these particular fractional numbers can be expressed as decimals without losing any precision. Um, if we had sort of long decimals that we had around um, or recurring decimals, things like that, then it's probably advisable to keep these in fractional form. But we see that if we convert into a decimal, we're, we're still left with um, sort of precise numbers um, like so. Um, so just be careful when converting to decimal that you're not losing any precision. If, if there's any rounding involved, um, it's probably worth leaving them in fractional form. So now we have found our ideal result. Um, we have um, all of these bottom left terms are zero, which is one of the things that we wanted. All of these diagonal terms are all one, which is another thing that we were looking for. The, the sort of bonus was if we could get some of these other terms to zero as well. Um, maybe a little bit more work, we could do that. Um, but actually, we'll see that it, it doesn't really matter. We can get around that um, in this next part as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to convert all of these um, coefficients and results back into their original equation form. You remember we, at the start, we started with some equations and we sort of transformed them into matrix form. We're going to transform them back. And what we see is something like this. We have uh, 1x plus 2.5y uh, plus 1.5z equals 18.5. Um, and a similar idea for these other two rows here. 0x plus 1y plus 1.5z equals 9. And 0x plus 0y plus 1z equals 4. So the first thing we can do straight away is we can remove all of these 0 coefficient terms. So 0x and 0y, these disappear. And first of all, we immediately get our result for z. Um, because we have 1z equals 4 or z equals 4. And so knowing this, we can substitute this into um, our second equation here because we're told that um, y plus 1.5z equals 9. Well, we know the value of z now, uh, z equals 4. And so y plus 1.5 times 4 is equal to 9. And we can solve that to find that y equals 3. And now we know that z equals 4 and we know that y equals 3. We can substitute both of these into the first equation, um, like, sh like, uh, like shown here. And we can solve to find that x equals 5. So finally, um, by using Gaussian elimination, we found that x equals 5, y equals 3, and z equals 4 in these um, three simultaneous equations that we were presented with at the start. We said that we were going to use two different methods in this video. Um, one of them was the Gaussian elimination method, which we've just done there. And the second was using the inverse matrix. Um, in a previous video in this series, we've talked about the inverse matrix and how to calculate the inverse matrix. We're not going to go into very much detail in the method in this particular video. Um, we'll skip some of the working just for time's sake. If you want to learn how to work out the inverse of a matrix, make sure you go back to the video where we cover that in more detail. But what we're going to do is we're going to use the same question, the same set of um, equations as an example. Uh, we know the answers that we should expect now from the previous section. Um, we're going to see whether we get the same result using the inverse matrix approach. So first of all, let's model our three equations as um, being shown in matrix form again. And let's, for example, say call this square matrix here, let's call this matrix A. And this column matrix of unknowns, we'll call that X, capital X. Um, just to avoid confusion with the small x and y and z. Um, and then this column of results here, 
let's call this capital Y. So what we talked about in the inverse, inverse matrix video previously is that here we've got an equation uh, which we could express as A x equals y. Using the inverse, we could say that x must be equal to the inverse of a multiplied by y. And so, again, we're not going to repeat the method for finding the inverse of this matrix. Um, it's, it's quite time consuming and we spent a lot of time in a previous video. But what we find is the inverse of this matrix is found to look something like this. Um, and again, if you want to pause this video and work this out for yourself and make sure you're happy with where that's come from, you can do. But the inverse matrix or the inverse of A um, looks like that in fractional form. And then once we've found the inverse matrix, it simply becomes a, a dot product um, exercise to multiply that inverse matrix by that column matrix, which we call Y. And so we could say that um, capital X is the inverse matrix multiplied by Y. And the full working for that, uh, we'll write that out here. A again, you can pause this video and, and make sure that you're happy with all of that. But this is covered in, in more detail in previous videos, um, if you're not sure where, where all this has come from. But either way, when we work out the result of each of these rows that we've calculated using the dot product, um, we find that these rows come to 5, 3, and 4. And if you remember, that was the same result that we found with our previous uh, method using Gaussian elimination as well. So I hope you found this video useful on using two different methods, Gaussian elimination and the inverse matrix to solve a system of equations to find the unknown values.